everybody! My name is Skyth, and today we're covering the research hunting, completion sent tingling, newest experience in the Pokemon franchise, Pokemon Legends Arceus. Let's see if this trip through time is able to be more advanced than the journeys of the present. <laughs> Released last week, Pokemon Legends Arceus is kind of the ultimate prequel to the Pokemon franchise, taking you all the way back to times before Pokemon were more than just pets or tools for battle. The story this time around is actually radically different from any mainline Pokemon game before it, seeing you falling through what seems to be a rift in the space-time continuum and stranded in a brand new region, where after helping this region's professor with catching his escape starters, you're eventually admitted into his research corporation. From there, the game sees you aiding this team in attempting to complete the first ever Pokedex by catching Pokemon and storing data on them, whilst also aiding the two semi-rival clans in calming the rampaging beasts known as Noble Pokemon. And honestly, this game's story is the best the mainline franchise has ever seen, though admittedly that bar is still ridiculously low. It doesn't even feel like a regular Pokemon game, there's no gyms to speak of, no real rival to take down, there isn't even a comically over-the-top evil team to deal with. To start off, this story and setting makes this game feel the least like a mainline Pokemon game to date. Yet it isn't so out there to class it as one of the admittedly much more enjoyable spin-offs like Pokemon Ranger or Mystery Dungeon. It seems to fall in this weird middle ground between the two, and honestly, I'm all in for it. This is the most fun I've ever had with a mainline Pokemon storyline since Black and White 2. Recent games really felt like Game Freak wasn't trying with the stories, but Legends Arceus spins that notion of full 180, as this is genuinely the most enjoyable storyline to date. After a pretty admittedly weak and slow start, littered with tutorials like every Pokemon game ever, the game gets way more interesting as it goes on. Exploring new areas, taking the direction in some surprisingly dark turns, even towards the start of the game where they're actively talking about throwing you out into the wilderness to die just because you're an outsider. I never thought an officially licensed Pokemon game would go this route, especially given how the game goes towards the end. Without spoiling anything, the final 20 minutes or so of the game is the best mainline Pokemon has ever been without context. This game really gives off the impression that the Mystery Dungeon team wrote the story, instead of Game Freak's usual writers. Anyway, let's move away from the amazing story for a moment to talk about the gameplay itself. How is it? Well, honestly, it's shockingly fun. After Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee scarred me with its dog shit and confusing catching mechanics, I was a little skeptical about how this game demonstrated handling catching Pokemon. But once I got into it, I really got into it. It's so much fun sneaking around these massive open areas just chucking balls at anything you see. It's so insanely satisfying to find a Pokemon in the wild and then just catch them with a Pokeball whilst hiding in the grass to the point where I honestly tried to avoid fighting the wild Pokemon altogether. Stealthing around undetected and expanding my never-ending arsenal of murderous creatures was way more enjoyable than just facing them head-on, and that's something I'd never even considered since fighting and weakening Pokemon is so integral to the game's mechanics that doing it any other way should be off-putting. But it's really not. One of the game's main objectives, much like every other Pokemon game, is to catch them all. And I think this is the first and most importantly only Pokemon game to ever actually make me want to literally catch them all. I wanted to hunt down each new species. Hell, if I didn't plan to have a specific Pokemon on my team, instead of just evolving the base form to get a new dex entry, I'd actively hunt down the evolved forms in different areas just to catch them in the wild. Having these areas be as big as they are and having the Pokemon simply just exist in the world is also beautiful to see. And what's more, using the environment to your advantage to startle or distract a fully evolved Pokemon and then catch it without having to engage in an unnecessary fight is really refreshing. Also, given how naturally the Pokemon interact with the world around them and that they just exist even if you aren't around to see it makes this game feel so much more alive than any Pokemon game before it. Another thing that adds to this is the addition of Alpha Pokemon, huge behemoths that are way bigger than their normal forms. These Pokemon are insanely strong and can easily wipe the floor with your team, but they also are able to be caught and added to your party. I really like this change as having bigger, stronger, and faster versions of normal Pokemon that also have better stats naturally and new moves is a really nice way to flesh out these wild creatures. 
These Pokemon, both normal and alpha forms, despite basically just walking around and not really doing much, still feel quite fleshed out because of the fact that they appear literally everywhere you go. And they even interact differently depending on the area of the region you're in. Another aspect of this game that was surprisingly fleshed out were the actual companions you spend the game with. The Galaxy Research Team all have surprisingly enjoyable personalities, that all vary wildly and even have mini arcs that they go through throughout the story. These aren't major life-altering events, but they certainly do change as the story goes on, something I've noted in the past as being one of Pokemon's biggest problems. Not every character is fleshed out, the townspeople still mostly suffer from stereotypical NPC syndrome and only have one or two lines of dialogue outside of quests, but the main characters in the story are just all really fun to talk to and it's nice to hear what they have to say. Oh yeah, and quests are a thing now. Throughout the game, you're able to expand the town you're given shelter in by aiding the townspeople with side quests, ranging from bringing them specific Pokemon, to filling specific dex entries and teaching the townsfolk about them. It's always enjoyable to just stroll around town or check the professor's blackboard for any new quests that crop up. These side quests never feel like something that forces you to go out of your way. For most of the game, I'd always run around the town before heading on a new expedition and pick up as many side quests as possible. Then by just exploring off the beaten path a bit and finding these hidden areas, I was able to clear most side quests that were set for me in one run, giving you more to do and more rewards to reap once you return back to the village. Another really nice returning feature is the ability to ride Pokemon like in Gen 7. However, here, this doesn't feel nearly as restrictive. You unlock these ride Pokemon at a decent pace and each has an actual useful function, as opposed to Gen 7 where you had way too many ride Pokemon and only used three of them at most. In Legends Arceus, each ride Pokemon has a purpose. Faster land travel, digging up items, climbing walls, preventing you from drowning with your pitiful swimming skills, and even flying across the land. Each ride Pokemon actually feels useful, and whenever you unlock a new one, it feels like so much more of the world has opened up to you. Running around these open areas already felt like a massive breath of fresh air, but with these new ride Pokemon allowing you to dash across the land or soar through the sky, or scale mountains without any issue, it really hit the nail on the head when making exploring these areas actually feel like exploring. I also found it nice how if you were ever out on an adventure and needed more tools, you didn't have to run all the way back to the base camp to purchase items. You you could actually craft whatever you needed right then and there provided you had the materials for it. Materials that could be farmed by having your Pokemon break rocks or attack trees. This was another really enjoyable feature, as it allows you to craft whatever you needed for any given situation on the fly. The crafting is pretty bare bones and simple, being as all you need are the materials and the actual crafting part is done for you, but it's a really nice feature for them to implement. I also find it funny how this game allows you to craft tons of different materials at once, meanwhile in Animal Crossing you have to do it one at a time. Another thing I surprisingly found enjoyable about the adventure was the difficulty. For most of the game, there doesn't seem to be an actual need to build up a team, given how few trainers there are and how your main objective aside from calming down the giant noble Pokemon is literally just to catch and research all the wild Pokemon around you. However, when I got into a fight with wild Pokemon or even just some of the trainers late into the game, I found myself watching my Pokemon faint a lot more than usual. I never lost all six of my team members or blacked out myself, but I did wind up with a lot more corpses on my hand than I thought I would. And this game is also no stranger to having wild Pokemon or even trainers gang up on you. If you engage in a battle with a wild Pokemon and there are other wild Pokemon around, they'll join in the fight too and make it even tougher for you. And plus, as far as I know, there's only a single instance of this, but very late into the game's story, you have to fight a trainer in a three-on-one battle against some surprisingly tough opponents. And honestly, this made the game way more fun. It encouraged me to not only think about crafting items like revives to have on me at all times, but also how and when to utilize another new feature called styles. Every move any Pokemon is able to use has a mastered state, which can be unlocked after using the move enough times or gaining enough levels or sometimes a combination of the two. These moves can then be used in both strong and agile styles to give new benefits. Strong style increasing the power of any given move, but also making it so the opposing Pokemon will be able to attack multiple times in a row, whilst Agile style has the opposite effect. These become immensely helpful when it comes to weakening and thus catching new Pokemon, or simply just bodying any of the alphas or scarce trainers that show up during the game. One final thing I want to touch on is the quality of life improvements which are pretty much all positives. Having things like evolution tied to a menu slot now instead of being a prompt every single level is a really good decision. 
alongside being able to finally nickname your Pokemon as many times as you want to and change out their moves instantaneously for no cost whatsoever. This is by far the best quality of life change the game made, as now you can swap out any attack a Pokemon may need for any given situation without having to fork over in-game cash for a TM or a heart scale to relearn a forgotten move. It's crazy how many features they changed ever so slightly just to make it that much easier to pick up and play. Now, despite me singing the praises of this game for way longer than I expected to, I do have some issues with this game. Let's begin with some story-based issues. Normally, I like to keep these reviews as spoiler-free as possible, so if you want to avoid this segment, just skip to this timestamp here. My first of the two story-based issues is that Noble Pokemon kinda suck. Their integration into the story is done amazingly well. It's the actual process of fighting them that I take issue with. Throwing the bombs at these massive Pokemon to calm them down seems to defeat the whole purpose of building up a team even more than the lack of trainers does. And the thing is, you can actually fight the nobles with your own Pokemon, but it's only to lower their defense so you can get some free hits in. I see fighting the Pokemon to calm them down as pretty counterintuitive, because surely engaging in a fight with one of these beasts would only lead to them being even more enraged, not being calmed down. So what if you had to fight them with your Pokemon before chucking the bombs at them? That way, it would seem as though your Pokemon actually contributed to making the Noble Pokemon weak enough for you to attempt to start calming it, rather than bullying it mid-fight for seemingly no reason. Personally, I think a much better way to have handled these Noble Pokemon fights would have been to give them two health bars instead of one. One that you had to take down with your Pokemon, and then one final one where the Noble is even more pissed off and prevents you from using your Pokeballs. So you have to calm it down using the bombs. Not only making your Pokemon seem more important, but also giving more importance to the bombs themselves. As is, the fights against the nobles are passable at best. But they could have been a lot more enjoyable had they not all boiled down to the same thing. And my other story-based complaint is that the endgame is ridiculously lackluster. After quelling the final noble Pokemon, the game's story seems to really kick up a notch, with you being cast out of the research team and left to fend for yourself only to slowly gain the trust of the three lake spirits and then return with a plan to save the region. Heading up to the giant pillar at the top of Mount Coronet, you have to battle and defeat the legendary Pokemon of your choice. Then once you've done that, you have to chase down the Origin Ball and then fight the other legendary in one final bomb-chucking fight. And after that, the game just ends? The ending to the game feels really dissatisfying and ends so abruptly that it just ends up feeling rushed. The game literally just jumps to the credits after the space-time rift is destroyed, and to me personally, it feels like they just gave up on this ending and wanted to get the story over with. Given how enjoyable 99% of the game's story is, it's really unfortunate to have such a rushed and empty feeling ending. My next issue is thankfully a much smaller one, which is that the process of moving up to the next star and thus being able to actually progress the story can become surprisingly tedious, especially as the game goes on. Aiming to unlock those final two areas of the game becomes surprisingly annoying given how scarce experience points get once you clear each area's story. The easiest way to rank up is to catch new Pokemon and complete their dex entries. However, there aren't that many new Pokemon in each given area, and the newer species become even rarer the more the game goes on meaning ranking up becomes more and more tedious as time goes on. I did say how fun and easy it is to catch Pokemon and clear their individual Pokedex entries, but when you're only getting bonus points, which for the most part will be stuck under four digits whilst ranking up relies on getting a few thousand points, it really makes it hard to actually want to continue the game, given how much unnecessary grinding is needed just to repeat the process only a few minutes later. Again, this is only a small problem being as it is still really fun to complete said tasks, but when you do eventually grow tired of seeing the same four or five Pokemon over and over again, which most certainly will happen a lot during your playthrough, it becomes harder and harder to enjoy these massive downtimes between progressing the story and exploring new areas. And lastly, I personally found the time distortion rifts that you'll occasionally see around the region to be kind of pointless. During my playthrough, they appeared so infrequently that I only saw two of them during my entire experience. Even during the post-game, I've yet to see one. And while yes, you can get new and rare Pokemon from them, if one spawns far away from where you are and you can't fly there or teleport with the camp system, then you'll most likely miss out on some rare Pokemon and you'll have to wait a very long time for a new one to spawn. It just feels like a really stupid way to artificially inflate the total playtime for people who actually want to complete the Pokedex. Like me. So overall, Pokemon Legends Arceus is honestly an amazing addition to the franchise, and is a beautiful breath of fresh air. Is it the best Pokemon game of all time? 
No, not to me personally, that honor still goes to Explorers of Darkness and most likely always will. Does it deserve all the praise it's been getting? Yes, absolutely. With an actual reason to literally catch every Pokemon, some really impressive quality of life changes, and some really well done world building. Yet with its slow and tedious way of progressing the story, the abysmal way the noble fights are handled, and the frankly rushed ending makes this game really hard to give a perfect score. As such, I'm going to be giving Pokemon Legends Arceus four ancient Pokeballs out of five. So that is going to bring us to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this one even a little bit, then be sure to drop a like on it. Comment your thoughts on Legends Arceus down in the comments below. And if you're new to the channel, first of all, welcome. And second, why not subscribe and hit that notification bell too? It's free and it helps out a ton. Lastly, if you want to see more of me on other social media platforms, then you can find links to all my other corners of the internet down in the description. Once again, thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, stay safe everyone, peace.